We go now to Bogota, Colombia, and Virginia Democratic Senator Tim Kaine, who has just returned from the Venezuela-Colombian border. Senator, uh, I want to ask you about what's happening in that country, but first, a, a little bit of what's happening here at home. Uh, the president was asked about uh, that attack in New Zealand, and he characterized uh, the threat of white nationalism as something he said is really just a, a small issue. Uh, do you believe globally white nationalism is on the rise? Uh, Margaret, it, it is on the rise, and the president should call it out, but sadly, he's not doing that. We saw in the aftermath of the horrible attack in Charlottesville that he tried to say that the white supremacists, neo-Nazis, neo-Confederates there were just, you know, good people. Um, but when you see church shootings in Charleston, a synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh, you see this hate-filled manifesto uh, of the shooter in New Zealand who is murdering Muslims, we have to confront the fact that there, there is a rise in white supremacy, uh, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim uh, attitudes. The president uses language often that's very similar to the language used by these bigots and racists. And if he's not going to call it out, then other leaders have to do more to call it out, and I certainly will. Well, the president did say it was a horrible thing that happened, but he said that the white nationalism issue is just a small group of people that have very, very serious problems. What do you attribute the rise to? Well, they to? have problems, but... Well, look, I think, that, I think the president is using language that emboldens them. He's not creating them. They're out there. But, you know, at the same time as he was tweeting out yesterday his support for the family members in New Zealand, and that was appropriate, um, he was vetoing the Senate's uh, rejection of his emergency declaration from Thursday, and he used the word invaders to characterize people coming to the nation's southern borders, which was exactly the same phrase that the shooter in New Zealand used to characterize the Muslims that he was attacking. That kind of language from the person who probably has the loudest microphone on the planet Earth is hurtful and dangerous, and it tends to incite violence. That's not what the president should do. You have to call out white supremacy, not minimize it, not say there's good people on both sides. And that was what was so discouraging about his comments about the shooting yesterday. You're referencing there, of course, what happened in Charlottesville with the on both sides comment. I want to ask you about uh, an exchange you had this week that seemed quite tense. You were very clearly frustrated with the acting secretary of defense, uh, Shanahan, uh, because you were asking why a list of military projects had not been provided to Congress. Uh, and this is a list of projects that would be directly uh, impacted by funding cuts due to reallocation for the president's border wall. Why weren't you given that list of projects? Well, Margaret, as you know, when the president made the emergency declaration in February, he indicated that he wanted to take $6.1 billion out of the Pentagon budget to deal with this non-military emergency. I'm on the Armed Services Committee. I represent Virginia. I have a child in the military. So I sent a letter on February 15th to the Secretary of Defense and said, if you're going to ransack the Pentagon's budget, tell me what projects you're going to cut or delay or eliminate. They wouldn't provide an answer. At the hearing on Thursday, we're, we're now going to vote that day on whether we support or reject the emergency declaration, and they still hadn't answered our question, what projects are at stake? At the hearing, he said, and in response to Senator Reid, our Democratic leader, oh, I'll send you the list later this afternoon. And you're right, I kind of blew up at him. You're going to give us the list after we vote? Um, because members of the Senate, this is highly relevant to the vote about the president's emergency declaration. What projects are you going to ransack out of the Pentagon budget? Is it going to be military housing? Is it going to be uh, trying to make our bases safer from terrorism with construction projects? Is it going to be rebuilding Tyndall Air Force Base that got blitzed in the hurricanes last fall? And they said they would give us the list after. But, Margaret, to add insult to injury, they had to walk that back. They don't even want to give us the list now at all because uh, the president's going to veto our, uh, our uh, rebuke of him, and we're going to have to have an override vote. I don't think the White House wants us to see the list before the override vote. I hope my Republican Why? colleagues will join together and say, if you want to take $6.1 billion, tell us where it's coming from. Why do you think the White House is withholding this information you say is so relevant 
because of an upcoming I vote. Think there's you, one you're reason. connecting. You think they're trying to influence the outcome of it. Absolutely. This is not the service secretaries. They have they've had the list since long before February. This is not the Secretary of Defense, in my view. This is the White House wanting to hold the list back because they worry that if senators and House members saw the potential projects that were going to be ransacked to pay for the president's wall, they would lose votes. And I think they're going to try to hide the list until that veto override vote occurs in the House and then in the Senate. But do you believe that any of your Republican colleagues have been told if their districts are going to be impacted? You're using the term ransacked. You're suggesting that monies are going to be taken out of bases perhaps across this country or projects across this country. That's not a suggestion, Margaret. That's what's going to happen. The, the military has testified to the Armed Services Committee that while the issue at the border of the United States is a significant challenge, it's a non-military emergency. That's th their words, not mine. And yet the president wants to take $6.1 billion from the Pentagon budget to deal with the non-military yeah. emergency. And that means those monies are coming out of somewhere. I have no knowledge that my Republican colleagues have been given a sneak peek at what those projects are. They should be asking for it just like I am. You are, of course, in Colombia, nearby uh, what is a, a country that is really uh, crippled in many ways economically right now, Venezuela. There are about three million refugees who have fled. The energy and uh, oil industry is collapsing, as is the economy there. What is it that you were going to the border to see? What did you learn? Um, well, Margaret, I wanted to see a couple of things. One, to support the Colombian government because their effort to provide assistance to these millions of Venezuelanos has been really momentous. But secondly, learn what more the United States can do. We have worked together, actually, in an accord between the administration and Congress to provide significant amounts of humanitarian aid, to, um, to work together, to pull together a coalition of nations. Fifty-five nations around the world have recognized that when the Venezuelan National Assembly said that there's essentially an absence in the office of the president because the president was illegitimately elected, that Venezuelan National Assembly then elevated the leader of the assembly to the position of interim president. That's all done in accord with the Venezuelan Constitution. Right, the but, US and but as you plus know, other nations Nicolas Maduro have gathered still, together on this. Nicolas Maduro still is in charge of that country, whether we like it or not. And these sanctions have not seemingly changed his calculus. Uh, the visas, the diplomatic isolation, what is this actually accomplishing at this point? Well, it's, um, it's giving hope to Venezuelans that there, fi there may finally be some change. The question isn't whether Maduro likes it or not. The question is what do the Venezuelan people want? Because the only interest that the United States have has is peace and liberty and ultimately democracy for the Venezuelan people who elected a National Assembly, and the National Assembly has determined that the election of President Maduro was illegitimate, there needs to be a new government. So what more can we do? Yep. More humanitarian aid, more work together to pull more nations into our coalition, organizations like the Organization of American States can do more. Um, the sanctions are important. They're having an effect. Um, sanctions are economic, but they're also visa restrictions on Maduro and his cronies as they try to travel abroad. Um, we need to give hope to the Venezuelan people that we stand with them and support them. And I went to see soup kitchens where I was visiting with 75-year-olds who had walked for days, and I was also visiting with mothers with young children, children who need cancer treatments but can't receive medicine in Venezuela, children who want to go to school, but the schools are closed, and so they actually cross the border mm -hmm. every day from Venezuela to go to schools in Colombia. It's a massive humanitarian crisis driven by one person, Nicolas Maduro, and the Venezuelan people are speaking out and they want something better. Well, arguably, it's not just Maduro, it's also his military that continues to support him. Has the Trump administration, whose policy you seem to support right now, have they underestimated how strong he is? Well, I don't, I don't know that they've underestimated it. Look, this is, this is not easy. It's a difficult situation. And I do generally support what the Trump administration has done, with one exception. I think loose talk about U.S. military action is a big mistake. One, because that's not for the president, it's for Congress. But second, the right strategy here, there's only one person using the military against Venezuelans, and it's Maduro. Only one person that's using violence, it's Maduro. 
uh, what we need to do is be strong in support of the international humanitarian effort to help Venezuelanos. But should, no, should the situation, Trump's it's not easy. And should President Trump send an envoy to negotiate with Maduro, since it seems we're negotiating with the Russians this coming week? Well, I, I think the, uh, look, I'm going to let the president and the secretary of state and others make that decision. I, I generally don't have problems with, with dialogue. You know, dialogue guarantees nothing, but the absence of dialogue is a challenge. But the Venezuelan people have spoken clearly about this. This isn't what the U.S. wants. It's what the Venezuelan people want. And when they elect a, a, a national assembly that overwhelmingly votes in accord with their constitution, that there's an absence in the office of the president, and we need to follow the Venezuelan constitution to put in an interim president while we work for free and fair elections. I want to support their desires going forward. I want to ask you about elections in this country uh, coming up in 2020. Uh, former President Obama had been mm -hmm. quoted as saying he thinks there needs to be new blood uh, in our political systems. Uh, do you agree with that? I mean, do Democrats need to see need to see new faces and not say the Joe Bidens of the world to run in 2020? Well, I, I do think new blood and new ideas. You can have a new idea when you're 61 years old like me or even, or even older. I, I do think the virtue of a big field right now is you have people out there who are advocating all kinds of policies to deal with the pressing issues. Democrats need to be known not just by our opposition to the president. We've got to be known for what we stand for. And more candidates, we had more to declare this week, and I think there are more to come. More candidates advancing the positive agenda. This is who we are as Democrats. This is what the nation needs. I think that over time gives us the best chance to run strong and win in 2020. But do you think Democrats need to put together a ticket that either looks more diverse or it leans more progressive in order to compete against President Trump, a man you know uh, can be tough to run against? I, I don't, yeah, I don't feel like I need to stage manage what Democrats do. I think we've got a process that sets up a series of primaries and caucuses in very diverse states and you're going to see a very diverse and large group of candidates already making that case. What we're seeing, Margaret, in Virginia in 2017 in our state elections, in 2018 in Virginia and across the country, is tremendous Democratic energy, including energy, as you mentioned, young, diverse candidates, voters, volunteers. Um, and I think that we're going to see that energy all the way through the elections in 2020 and beyond. Senator Kane, thank you for joining us. Safe travels. Thank you, Margaret. Absolutely.